through um, the first hour with each, each speaker having 15 minutes to give introductory comments on, on an area that they uh, feel most comfortable with. Um, uh, thank you all for coming and thanks for, for the, the people who are presenting to participate in this. I, uh, I talked to, um, to David early on, I contacted him. Just when the, when the rhetoric with, with regards to Israel and Iran started to heat up, uh, you know, it's always kind of going, coming and going in waves, at least for the people, uh, for the people who receive the news through the, through the me media. Uh, I guess the scholars receive it that way too, but everyone's got different sources. But it seems to come in waves up and down. And I, I, I just was struck with, I'm always struck with how, how the, uh, these, these forces that are, that are ever at work trying to move the people to beat the drum of war, or at least accept the sound of the drum of the beat you know, of, of war. And uh, it's just so unsettling to me. And so to have uh, the opportunity, to, to offer the opportunity to pe for people in Charlottesville to hear some sort of uh, deeper perspective, or a more informed perspective that's not ridden with uh, propaganda, I feel like it's, it's a worthwhile thing. So thank you, for, uh, all the people who have, who have come to offer that perspective. The first two speakers, I think, will, will focus on Syria. The second two speakers will, will focus on Iran. Uh, the first speaker is Helena Coben. She was a reporter based in Beirut, Lebanon from 1974 to 1981. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Helena. Um, she wrote for the BBC, the Christian Science Monitor, the Sunday Times, ABC News. In 1987, she wrote a book entitled The Palestinian Liberation Organization. It's still in print, I believe. Uh, she's gone on to write six more books since then. And now, among other things, she authors the blog Just World News and runs uh, the book publishing company Just World Books. Is that what it's called? Just World Books. Uh, she has a table set up here in the back with books from that company. She's a member of the Charlottesville Friends Meeting, the Quaker House here in town, and she's a voice for peace and justice, and she's going to speak first. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks for organizing this evening. Um, it's really important, I think, after we've, especially in the week when we've had the two presidential candidates talking about um, issues of foreign policy, focusing on the Middle East which I guess is not wholly surprising. Just before I get into what I'm going to say about Syria, I want to urge you to go, obviously, and look at the books from my publishing company. The two of the most recent titles are The General Son by Miko Pellet, which is actually a runaway bestseller and really a fabulous book. He's doing um, nationwide tours. He's going to be in Charlottesville for the uh, book festival um, next March. And then this one is Wrestling in the Daylight, a, a Rabbi's Path to Palestinian Solidarity by Rabbi Brandt Rosen, um, who is on the, he co-chairs the Rabbinical Council of Jewish Voice for Peace, which is an amazing, wonderful activist um, organization. So anyway, you can pick up, you can buy the books or you can pick up the flyers. So that's the commercial interlude. So thank you very much. Um, well, I've been going to Syria off and on <laughs> since 1970. Okay, I guess I don't understand these things. I should just not press on it. Um, I think I do this. No, not a good idea. Very bad idea. Okay. Um, and uh, working in Syria professionally since 1974, when I was a correspondent in Beirut, I used to go over to Damascus once a month or so um, to cover stories there and um, developed a lot of friends and contacts and colleagues there. Most, uh, two of my seven books have been about the Syrian-Israeli balance. And I've done a lot of interviewing in both countries on that issue. Um, most recently, I was a member of something called the U.S. Syrian Working Group, which was organized by Search for Common Ground. And from about 2005 until last year, we were working to establish a back channel between Washington and the uh, 
regime in Syria, but actually, whether under Bush or under Clinton, there was no interest in having a working back channel, um, because it's now quite clear that under Bush and under Obama, did I say Obama last time or did I say Clinton? Anyway, it's kind of all going into one fuzzy um, mm -hmm. democratic kind of thing. Um, but under Bush as under Obama, there is actually a policy, a long-standing policy of regime change for Syria, including the funding through this Middle East Partnership Initiative, MEPI, of opposition uh, movements that has continued um, under Obama. In fact, I think they increased the funding under Obama. So looking back on my participation in that effort, I feel that we were um, either misled or personally misguided to think that we could um, succeed. And I feel rather bad about that because I invested quite a lot of personal energy in it. Um, so I, I've known people, Syrian nationals, um, quite well since the 1970s, people in the opposition and people in the regime, both. Now it's clear also from my many years on the uh, Middle East Advisory Committee of Human Rights Watch, that the regime in Syria is a, a regime that abuses human rights um, in a systematic and fairly bad way. All the, I hate to make comparisons, but I have to say it was not as bad as the way that Saddam Hussein did. Um, just like the figures and the kind of things that were happening. Syria has been subject to U.S. sanctions since the early 1980s or the late 1970s, I forget which. But, you know, long-term sanctions, including that in Syria, for example, the national airline has um, European aircraft, but they are reliant on some American electronics, avionics, to control them. And they're, they're not allowed to get the updates and the upgrades for those avionics that are essential to passenger safety. And, you know, the Syrian government has, has pleaded with Washington to free up those avionics, um, so far as I know, to no effect. And similarly, with a lot of uh, medical um, technology that they really need for saving lives of civilians, and that's all been blocked also. Um, and of course, we see the same kind of thing happening against Iran. But I just want to remind people that we've been doing it against Syria for 30 years at this point. Um, I don't know how to fit this into 15 minutes. Maybe I can speak really, really fast. Um, when the Arab Spring started last year, I followed with huge um, support and enthusiasm what was happening in Tunisia and in Egypt and elsewhere. But I said from that point that Syria is different, and I supported the nonviolent opposition movements in Syria. But I said the regime actually has much more legitimacy in the eyes of the citizenry than the regimes in either Tunis or Cairo had. And there are many reasons for this that I can go into. But, I mean, I, this is also building on, on the, whatever it is, three and a half or four decades that I've been following Syria, where there have been many points at which, for example, in 1976, the Syrian army was sent into Lebanon against the Palestinians, and a lot of people in Beirut said, oh, you know, the Syrian regime is going to crumble because this, you know, violates their commitment to Arab solidarity to such an extent that they will lose internal legitimacy and crumble, and they didn't. And there have been a lot of other occasions when people have said, oh, the Syrian regime is on the point of collapse, and then it doesn't collapse. You know, so therefore, it has sources of internal legitimacy that are not readily apparent to people who read only the New York Times or other organs of misinformation in this country. Um, so, so when the Arab Spring started and, and had those amazing successes in Tunisia and, and Egypt, 
people were thinking that half the last side would be the next one to, to, to fall. And I said, no, it's not going to happen because the regime has sources of internal legitimacy. There are non-violent opponents inside Syria, and there are many supporters of the regime inside Syria. From that point, I would say March of last year, certainly April of last year, I was writing consistently on my blog that whereas the opposition has sources of resilience, so too does the regime. It's not going to be that, you know, just simple thing that happened in Tunisia or Egypt. Now, when you have two forces that are kind of equally balanced and neither can overthrow the other, you have the potential for very prolonged conflict that can escalate very, very easily. We saw that between Iran and Iraq during the 1980s. We've seen it in so many conflicts around the world. So I said at that point, and this is going back to April of last year, that the absolute priority for people in this country or around the world who hate war and who have been disgusted by the, the cost of the wars that our country has waged, our priority has to be to urge an all-party intra-Syrian negotiation for a transition to a more rights-respecting <coughs> order there. That is a negotiation that involves both the regime and the opposition. And that's really important. Now, I'm building here on the work I've done on the transition to democracy in South Africa. You would never have had a transition to democracy in South Africa. You may still have had, like, the apartheid regime in power today and internal conflict having continued for the past 20 years in South Africa. If you had said from the get-go, the de Klerk regime has to go. The transition was only possible in the relatively non-violent way that it happened because the negotiation involved the de Klerk regime. And nowadays, we see Secretary Clinton actually making real strides along with other colleagues in the international community in opening up the political system in Myanmar, Burma. How is she doing that? Is she doing that by saying the junta has to go? No, she's not. She's doing it by involving the junta, which is a, you know, I mean, talk about a junta that, that engages in terrible human rights abuses. The junta in Myanmar is right up there with the, the worst rights, rights abusers around the world. So she's engaged them with, obviously, the National League for Democracy and their leader, Aung San Suu Kyi and has succeeded in opening up significant political space, including with these latest parliamentary elections in which the National League for Democracy ran and took most of the seats. That would never have been possible if she had said from the get-go, as our president and she have said with regard to Syria, that first of all, the regime has to go. So their insistence that the regime has to go as a precondition for anything has kept the conflict going, has not only kept the conflict going, but I know from my living in Lebanon during the civil war there for six years of the civil war and covering it as a journalist and seeing my own family, because I was then married to a Lebanese person, split in half by the civil war. When you have such conflicts, unless there is an, a determined and visionary and inclusive peace process, which eventually in Lebanon they got to in 1989, 14 years after the, the Civil War started. It was very inclusive, included all parties. Unless you have such a peace process, the conflict will go on and on and on, and it will tend to get worse. And what have we seen in Syria? Actually, the first acts of violence by, the, by people who claim to be opposition supporters happened in April of 2011. It's been a, a violent opposition from very early on. Some people now say, oh, just recently, you know, they've been forced into violence. And then I just want to wrap up with a couple of main points. 
looking at the excuses that people in the non-violent or people who are sympathizers of the Syrian opposition, excuses they give for why the violence is somehow necessary or okay that is used by the opposition. The first is, we had no alternative but to use violence. Well, of course, people who use violence always say that. It's not, ipso facto, a, a convincing argument. But they say, you know, the regime drove us to it. Look, the revolution in Egypt was totally nonviolent. Their main slogan was Silmian, Silmian, Silmian. Peacefully, peacefully, peacefully. They met horrible violence from the regime. Do you remember the camels and the, and the horses? Well, that's what you saw in Cairo. But what was happening outside of Cairo, away from the camera's eye, in Port Said, in Suez City, in Alexandria, was a lot more killing by the regime and its supporters. But yet, the people from the Ikhwan al-Muslimin and, and the, the, the other portions of the opposition kept to the slogan of Silmian, Silmian, and Silmian, which at the end of the day is the only way to win over the, the rank and file soldiers and security people who are on the front line. The other argument that is made in favor of uh, the, the vile, men of violence in Syria is that we had to put snipers at the corners of the non-violent demonstrations in order to protect the demonstrations. Can you imagine if Martin Luther King had tried to use that argument here in the 1960s? I mean, there is no theory of non-violence that says you help the non-violent movement by putting snipers at the corners. In fact, it just obviously invites much more retribution from the regime. And from that perspective, you have to say that a lot of the violence in Syria needs to be blamed on the opposition. They've committed violence themselves, directly, and they have also invited the regime's violence. Of course, you can say the regime has other options and shouldn't have used violence. I agree. Neither side should be using violence. But there are so many excuses given in this country for the violence of the Syrian opposition. And what they have done is they have absolutely squeezed out the internal Syrian non-violent opposition mass movement. You don't hear about that barely at all these days. All you hear about is these people from the so-called Free Syrian Army and from the, all the little Kata'ib and the Nusrat and the Jebhat and I don't know what, many of whom are Al-Qaeda foreign <coughs> fighters coming in with a huge amount of funding and support from the Saudis and the Qataris. And I, I mean, if anybody thinks that Saudi Arabia and Qatar are exemplary midwives for a process of democratization, well, we can have a discussion about that afterwards. Um, my last point is about my friends here in the human rights movement in this country. It has really upset me a lot to see the degree to which people in this country who were steadfast against the invasion of Iraq and have been very strongly anti-war on a whole lot of issues over the past 20 years, how so many of them have been lining up for escalation and, and war in Syria under the rubric of this thing called humanitarian intervention. Well, I know because I've lived in a war, war is never humanitarian. War is always anti-humanitarian. And to advocate for war under the rubric of intervention, which is a weasel word. Intervention used to mean you help people. It didn't used to mean you bomb people. That's what it means now. And the idea that it could be in any way humanitarian is something I just wish I could take some of these well-meaning liberals in this country and elsewhere in the West, human rights activists, who have been pursuing policies that are for escalation and to the point of war in Syria, take them to live in a war zone with me for even six weeks. They would see the world differently, but they haven't. They've never had the experience. So anyway, that's all I have to say, and I'm sure that others will say. I'm really looking forward to the rest. Thanks.